Hello everyone and welcome to our channel. Today, we're diving into a crucial topic in software development, the solid design principles. These five principles are essential tools for any developer looking to craft clear, maintainable, and flexible code. Whether you're just starting out or are an experienced coder, mastering these principles will significantly boost your programming skills. The acronym SOLID stands for Single Responsibility, Open Closed, Liskov Substitution, Interface Segregation, and Dependency Inversion. These terms might seem abstract at first, but don't worry. In our series, we'll break them down using intuitive visuals and concrete coding examples to help you understand and apply each principle step by step. Single Responsibility Principle Let's start with the Single Responsibility Principle, which I consider the most fundamental of all. This principle states that each class should have only one reason to change, meaning it should have just one job to do. Often, a class with multiple responsibilities becomes complex, especially if it has a complicated internal state. Changing one function could ripple through its internal state, inadvertently impacting other areas. This complexity can reduce the class's maintainability, reusability, and scalability. For a clearer illustration, imagine a robot designed to function as a chef, driver, painter, and repairman all at once. These tasks are quite distinct, and lumping them together violates the single responsibility principle. If this robot malfunctions, all its functions fail simultaneously. Contrast this with having four separate robots, each dedicated to one of these roles. If one breaks down, the others continue to function, which aligns perfectly with the principle. Now, let's examine a Java code example to solidify our understanding. Consider the employee service class that handles both employee management tasks like querying and updating information, and also manages email notifications. These functions are unrelated, and it's inefficient for one class to handle both. A better design would separate these tasks. Employee service would manage only employee details, while a new notification service class would handle the email notifications. This approach adheres to the single responsibility principle, enhancing the software's maintainability, scalability, and reusability. Having explored how the single responsibility principle simplifies our systems, let's dive into another essential concept, the open-closed principle. This principle states that software entities like classes, modules, and functions should be open for extension but closed for modification. In simpler terms, this means we should be able to add new features without altering existing code. Why is this principle so crucial? It allows us to enhance our systems with new functionalities without disrupting what already works. This approach not only reduces the likelihood of introducing errors, but also boosts the overall stability of the software. Let's revisit our robot example to see this principle in action. Imagine we've designed a robot with a fruit knife in its left hand, primarily for cooking tasks. What if we now want it also to handle basic repairs? Here's the dilemma. If we ignore the open-closed principle, we might consider modifying the robot by replacing the fruit knife with a screwdriver. However, such modifications are not only time-consuming and costly, but could also affect the robot's long-term reliability. A better approach adheres to the open-closed principle. Instead of altering the existing setup, we could add a screwdriver to the robot's right hand. This adjustment allows the robot to perform both cooking and repairing tasks without any changes to its original configuration. This method significantly simplifies adding new functionalities without overhauling the existing mechanics. The robot becomes not only more versatile but also remains cost-effective and less prone to errors. To deepen our understanding, Let's examine two Java code examples regarding the open-closed principle. In the first scenario, which doesn't align with the open-closed principle, the payment processor class relies on a series of if-else statements to manage different payment methods. 
adding a new payment method thus requires altering the existing code, clearly breaching the principle. In contrast, a compliant design involves the payment processor class working with a payment interface, iPayment method, to process payments. This setup means we simply add new classes that implement the iPayment method interface when introducing new payment methods without modifying any existing code. Such a structure not only makes the payment processor flexible to new payment options, but also stable and scalable as it remains unchanged. Next, we delve into the third solid design principle, the Liskov substitution principle. Introduced by Barbara Liskov, this principle underscores that subclasses should seamlessly replace their base classes without compromising the program's correctness. Essentially, objects of a subclass should substitute for their superclass objects flawlessly, without triggering any errors or exceptions. Why is this principle crucial? It ensures the integrity of the inheritance mechanism, which is commonly used for code reuse. Misusing inheritance, however, can create inconsistencies between child and parent classes. This disparity can prevent the subclass from fitting perfectly into the places where the parent class was used, complicating the code and making it difficult to maintain. The Liskov substitution principle provides essential guidance on correctly using inheritance. Consider this scenario. We have two robots, a father robot named Mike and his son, Jack. Mike is programmed to make coffee, serving guests whenever they desire a cup. Now, imagine a day when Mike is unavailable, but the guests still want coffee. Jack, however, can only provide mineral water, not coffee. This situation highlights a violation of the Liskov substitution principle, because Jack, as Mike's subclass, fails to inherit and perform his father's crucial function, coffee making. The guests expect coffee, but Jack's inability to provide it leads to a service breakdown. Conversely, in a scenario adhering to the Liskov substitution principle, Jack, as Mike's subclass, fully inherits and performs Mike's functions. Should Mike be unavailable, Jack steps up, prepares, and serves coffee just as his father would. Both Mike and Jack, therefore, can fulfill the guest's coffee needs, perfectly aligning with the Liskov substitution principle. Jack's ability to seamlessly substitute for Mike whenever necessary ensures continuity and quality of service. To further explore this principle, consider these two Java code examples illustrating both compliance and non-compliance with the Liskov substitution principle. In one design, we have a bird class equipped with greet and fly methods. However, not all birds, like ostriches, can fly. This design flaw violates the Liskov substitution principle because an ostrich, as a subclass of bird, cannot perform the fly method, thus failing to seamlessly replace the base class in all its roles. In a compliant design, we modify the structure. The bird class retains only the greet method. A new class, flying bird, extends bird, and includes the fly method. Therefore, birds capable of flying are subclasses of flying bird, while flightless birds like ostriches are simply subclasses of bird. This approach not only demonstrates adherence to the Liskov substitution principle by establishing an appropriate class hierarchy, but also ensures that each class's functionality accurately reflects its real-world characteristics. Such a design enhances the code's maintainability, robustness, and flexibility. Next, we're diving into the fourth solid design principle, the interface segregation principle. This principle stresses that a class shouldn't be burdened with interfaces it doesn't use. Simply put, a class should only implement the methods it truly needs. This approach aims to break down bulky interfaces into smaller, more specific ones. This way, classes can focus on only the interfaces relevant to them, avoiding unnecessary functions. Such a design minimizes system complexity, boosts code maintainability, and enhances overall flexibility. Let's visualize this with an example involving two robots. The first robot lacks an antenna, whereas the second is equipped with one. Originally, our design mandated that all robots, regardless of their design, should be able to walk, talk, and rotate an antenna. However, this general approach forces our first robot into a dilemma. 
it's expected to perform an action, rotating an antenna, which it physically can't. This clearly breaches the interface segregation principle. In a revised design, each robot implements only the capabilities it possesses. The first robot, lacking an antenna, sticks to walking and talking. The second robot, with its antenna, manages all three tasks, walking, talking, and rotating the antenna. This setup ensures that each robot is only equipped with the functionalities it requires and uses, fully adhering to the interface segregation principle. To deepen our understanding, let's look at two Java code examples, illustrating both non-compliance and compliance with this principle. Initially, we define a worker interface that includes methods for work and sleep. Both our human and robot classes implement this worker interface. However, it's illogical for the robot, represented by the robot class, to implement the sleep method as robots don't sleep. A more fitting approach, aligned with the interface segregation principle, involves refining our interfaces. We separate the worker interface to include only the work method and introduce a new sleeping interface for the sleep method. Consequently, humans, under the human class, implement both interfaces, addressing both working and sleeping. Robots, on the other hand, implement only the worker interface. This selective implementation ensures that each class only includes necessary functionalities, thus eliminating redundant operations, decreasing system dependency, and increasing both flexibility and maintainability of our code. Finally, let's explore a vital concept in the solid design principles, the dependency inversion principle. This principle centers around two key ideas. Firstly, high-level modules should not rely on low-level modules. Instead, both should depend on abstractions. Secondly, abstractions should not rely on the details. Rather, the details should depend on abstractions. The primary goal of the dependency inversion principle is to minimize the direct dependency between high-level and low-level classes by introducing an abstraction layer. This approach greatly enhances the code's maintainability and the system's flexibility. With high-level modules not tied to the specific implementations of low-level modules, the system becomes more adaptable to changes. Let's visualize this with an example involving robots. In the initial design, imagine a robot built with a specific, non-interchangeable brand of light bulb. If this bulb fails, the whole robot must be sent for repairs which clearly goes against the dependency inversion principle. In a redesigned version, the robot features a standard power socket, enabling it to connect with any compatible light bulb or electrical device. This setup makes replacements straightforward and truly embodies the dependency inversion principle. Here, the robot represents the high-level module, while the light bulb or other electrical devices act as the low-level modules. Neither depends directly on the other, Instead, both rely on the intermediary abstraction of the power socket. To deepen our understanding, let's examine two Java code scenarios that illustrate non-compliance and compliance with the dependency inversion principle. Initially, the customer service class is tightly coupled to a specific database implementation, Mongo repo implementation. This setup represents a strong dependency, violating the dependency inversion principle. On the other hand, in the revised design, customer service relies on an abstract customer repository interface. This interface can have various implementations, such as Mongo repo implementation or in-memory repo implementation, providing flexibility and allowing for easy swapping of storage strategies. For instance, during testing phases, in-memory repo implementation might be used for simplicity while Mongo repo implementation could be utilized in a production environment to interact with a real database. For developers familiar with the Spring framework, it's worth noting that Spring's dependency injection feature is a practical application of the dependency inversion principle. This functionality makes applications developed with Spring easier to test, maintain, and extend. Thank you so much for watching our video today. I hope it has deepened your understanding of the solid design principles. Single responsibility. Open-closed, Liskov substitution. Interface segregation and dependency inversion. These principles are essential 
for creating software systems that are not only robust and flexible, but also easy to maintain. Consider how you might apply the open-closed principle in your current projects. We'd love to hear how you're using these concepts in real life, so please share your experiences and thoughts in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell to stay updated on our latest content. We're excited to keep exploring vital software system design concepts with you. Thanks again for tuning in. See you in the next video.